Welcome everyone. You are joining us for a user guide to image quality assessment for artificial intelligence. This webinar is presented by Dot Photon and hosted by Photonics Media. Today you're going to hear from Dr. Ariane Burkowski, Dr. Bruno Sanguinetti, and Dr. Gerhard Holst. Dr. Burkowski is an application specialist at Dot Photon. She received her doctorate in bioengineering and biotechnology at EPFL Lausanne. Dr. Sanguinetti is the co-founder of Dot Photon and head of research and development. He has dedicated the past 10 years of his career to bringing cutting edge quantum cryptography and metrology technologies to the market. Dr. Holst is a senior imaging product and application scientist at Excelitas PCO. He received a doctorate from the University of Dortmund in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute for System Physiology. In this session, they are going to share insights into recent work involving standardization and image quality assessment to help future-proof image data. You can ask questions or leave comments in the chat box at any time. If you have any technical issues during the event, please log out and back in to rejoin. You will be able to access the recording of this webinar online after the event, and you will receive a link to that recording in your email inbox. So with nothing further from me, I'd like to welcome Drs. Burkowski, Sanguinetti, and Hulse. Welcome. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, uh, Ariane. I will. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having us here today, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, so, today, uh, together with Bruno and Kenar, we're going to try to give you some insight on uh, image quality, uh, specifically for, for AI. So, uh, as an overview, we will start by showing you a bit of uh, some uh, artificial intelligence applied to images, some examples and uh, the typical workflows. And then we will try to see some of the challenges that we face during AI applications, specifically concerning the data quality and the generalizability. And then Bruno will give us some insight about uh, this last topic and, and how Jetra, which is our software, uh, how does it work? And then Gerard will, will jump in to, to cover a bit more about this image quality and standards um, that are used more in the, in the sensor and the camera world. So as you all may already know, the, we're living in the era of big data. So there are more and more images and data being produced. And this is mainly because we have better systems, and better cameras, better chips, which means that we can acquire higher quality images, uh, bigger images. And of course, that also means that we have to then process all of this data. And in order to process them, we can no longer rely only on the humans. Uh, so this is why artificial intelligence algorithms have risen in the last decades, because we need uh, automation in order to be able to perform uh, these tasks. And this is something that uh, is, can be seen in academy, in also in industry. Basically, most of uh, the tasks are now being targeted uh, using AR or machine learning algorithms. So some of the typical applications that you can do using AI for images, uh, I mean, they're, they're quite uh, varied. For example, you can apply some restoration techniques in which you can have, for example, here you have images that were acquired with very low um, intensity or exposure time, and then you can apply um, restoration techniques using AI in order to improve the, 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 the visual appearance of the images. You can also perform, for example, denoising, um, super resolution, where you start from a lower resolved image and then you try to get a better resolution from, from this one, and then some other tasks, like, for example, segmentation or classification. So, um, but then the typical workflow for, for AI, like an overview, it would be starting from defining your problem that you want to solve. So, for example, you want to classify or you want to do a regression or a segmentation. Then depending on the problem, of course, you will acquire different types of data and this will depend a lot on what you want to resolve. And then you can choose whether you want to uh, target this issue using a machine learning algorithm, uh, which usually requires that the user extracts some feature from the data. So, for example, the intensity of the images, and then you can choose the algorithm of interest. You can also then go towards a more uh, different uh, uh, application, like, for example, with deep learning. And in this case, what you would have to do is to choose, for example, the architecture of the network. And then again, you have to choose the algorithm of interest. Now, in this entire workflow, there are quite different ways that you can improve the performance of the output. 
And there are some that are centered more in, in terms of the model, meaning that you can change the algorithm, the network, for example, the number of layers or how they're connected in order to improve the performance of the architecture. Or you can also do so by uh, uh, targeting the data per se. So you can try to improve, for example, the quality or how the data was acquired in order to improve the performance of the network. So because today the seminar is about image quality, we will center more about the data per se for AI applications. So this is an example of a typical uh, uh, problem uh, that can be solved with uh, AI. So you have your images, for example, these are uh, white blood cells. So this would be your raw image. And then you have a label, in this case it's a mask. And the idea here would be to segment. So basically the typical workflow would be that you train your network using your raw images and your label, and you want to train it so that it's able then to segment uh, the, the images. Once you train the network, you try to uh, then you go to validation, meaning that you will use some uh, different uh, uh, scores in order to see how well was the training performed. And then if you're not happy, you can always go back and fit the model and go back and forth until you, your network is uh, well trained and you're happy with the results. And then you can test it with a, a, another data set, a new data set that the network hasn't seen yet and interpret the results to see if you are okay with the, with the performance. Now, some challenges arise, as I was saying, you can, be more, you can solve them in terms of the, the, the model architecture, or also you can go towards more of the uh, data. So for some of the challenges are, for example, the quantity and the quality of the data during the training and this validation process can, of course, affect the performance of these uh, networks. And also this uh, uh, generalizability, which is when you train the network with certain data, but then how can you apply it to a different type of data? So this is something that Bruno will cover later. So first, let's go into the image quality. How can it impact the output? Uh, and this, of course, depends on the application. Now, when we talk about image quality, this is a very uh, broad concept. And this is an, uh, a definition that I will quickly read to you. So image quality can refer to the level of accuracy with which different imaging systems capture, process, store, compress, transmit, and display the signals and form an image. So basically, image quality really depends on how the image was captured, the type of processing that you want to do, and of course, the application that you want to perform. So, of course, this is not an easy uh, definition and there are uh, different communities and groups that are trying to assess uh, how, how you can assess image quality, but also how you can uh, define it in a standard way, depending on, on the field. So, for example, Quarib Limi is one of these uh, groups that tries to assess image quality and reproducibility for light microscopy data. And then there's also, for example, the European Machine Vision Association, which is also uh, another uh, uh, standardization, but in this case for machine vision sensors and cameras. And Gerard will cover this more in detail later in the talk. And then, for example, there's also AI audit, which is more in standardizations for AI methods for health, diagnosis, etc. So basically, as you can see, image quality is not a, a, an easy definition and it's not, uh, there's no still uh, standard way to, to, to check for the quality. This is still work in progress. However, one of the main important things is to actually understand how was the data captured and what is the application that they're willing to do. So for example, if we go uh, for digital image generation, the typical way that an image is, uh, is generated is that you have your photons that it arrives to the optics. Then uh, these uh, photons are converted into electrons. There's some analog processing, digital processing, and then finally the task. So if you understand uh, how the, the image was formed, so you can trace uh, the generation of this image, for example, from the sensor or from the camera, you can have a very good understanding on the distribution of how the image was created and therefore the uncertainties that come with this uh, distribution. So, and if you know this, this is very important so that later when you apply the different processing that you want to do, you can do so in an accurate way so that you're not actually propagating uncertainties or biases. So that's why we say that raw is actually a well-defined measurement because we know how it was uh, 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 generated and we can know the uncertainties that come with it. So raw, we say that it has low precision by high accuracy, whereas if you process the images, they have high precision but low accuracy. For example, if you perform some denoising in the image, your background will, of course, have a higher precision because the pixels will all look uh, similar, but actually the accuracy will, will be lower between the images. 
So as long as, so the important thing is that if you know your uncertainty, so if you know your errors and you have a well-defined distribution and you have independent and unbiased errors, basically with this you can then apply any statistics like for example averaging or some higher order statistics like the ones that are applied with the kernel during AI and you can be, do so in such a way that you can uh, propagate the errors so that you don't have biases or you don't have artifacts adding in the images. Now, some examples of when, if you don't do this correctly, you might have problems in the outcome. So, for example, one typical case is stitching. So, this is when you, you, your image or your sample that you want to uh, uh, image is too big for the field of view. So, you have to apply stitching, meaning that you image uh, several different uh, smaller sets of images and then you group them together uh, uh, by doing some, for example, some blending in the boundaries. And if you do not know correctly the statistics of your image and how are the errors of it and you cannot propagate them properly, what you end up having is that you can have the sort of artifacts that you can see here, which might be invisible for the human eye, but then when you apply some deconvolution, denoising, or for example, segmentation, this can of course affect the performance of the of the, of the outcome. Another example is, for example, when you have a when you change the dynamic uh, range, this can also uh, uh, affect the outcome depending on the application. So, this is a, a 3D uh, mouse brain. So, and here the little spots are the neuronal nuclei. And the idea here was to show how, depending on the type of uh, or of the dynamic of the bit depth, you can actually change the outcome. So here the raw images are 16-bit images, and if you compare the segmented uh, nuclei compared to the 8-bit, what we saw is that there is a 20% difference in the number of uh, of the count of this uh, uh, of, of the nuclei. So basically, this means that even though the 8-bit and the 16-bit image by eye they look the same, the application here, which was the spot detection and segmentation perform completely different uh, just by changing the bit depth. And finally, another uh, uh, type of, uh, uh, of processing that can give rise to artifacts is the compression. So JPEG 2000, for, a, for example, gives rise to images that to the eye, to the human eye, they look exactly the same. But then when you apply this uh, simple, for example, the difference between uh, two consecutive pixels, what we see is that in the original image, there there are no biases. Jetro, which is our software that we will see later, also adds no, no, no biases. But when we see the JPEG 2000, we see that there are some artifacts appearing here. So basically, overall, if we know how we can trace back how the image was generated, this is important because then we can know how are the errors and we can propagate them correctly. We can, uh, so that's why we say that raw image is a well-defined measurement because we know how are the uncertainties there. And with this information, we can then reduce the artifacts so that we cannot impact the accuracy, uh, even though some artifacts are invisible to the human eye, but might be important for machine vision uh, applications. So now that we saw this, um, of course, as we see, the, uh, the quality depends a lot on the application. So what are the characteristics of the images that are important for different applications? So for this, there was a study that was in collaboration with Dot Photon, and the idea was to first take some raw images, perform different processing, so different image processing that we will see later, and then uh, do different combinations of these processings for uh, using a typical machine learning pipeline. And depending on the application, for example, segmentation or, uh, or some other application, you will see that the processing that you need is actually different so that the performance will be better. So the goal was to see how combining this raw and this process data, we can actually identif identify more favorable data models that can be used depending on the application of the machine learning task. So here they started with white blood cells under a light microscope. And these are some of the image processing uh, that was applied to these images, for example, black level correction, um, color correction, et cetera. And then by applying them in uh, combining them in different ways, then using the machine learning pipeline, what they saw is that depending on the application that they wanted, so for example, for uh, classification, the different combination of processing was different than for segmentation. And this can only be achieved if you start from your raw image, and then you can apply, of course, all the different processing steps and enhance the different features. That's why we say that the, the raw image actually has this value because you can go into different tasks 
and enhance different features of the image that might be uh, better suited for that application. So again, raw and processed data uh, can be used to identify the models that can be avoided or that can be more beneficial depending on the machine learning task. And that, of course, different applications lead to different processing of the images. And now Bruno will explain to you how this can be done with the generalizability. Right. Um, hello, everyone. So what I wanted to show is, uh, as well, uh, in, a, in a practical engineering application, how you would apply some of, uh, of these uh, concepts. So what you want is to make your machine learning robust. And to make it robust, it basically means that you know that, for, uh, that you can qualify uh, the image on the input, and you know that with that image, you're going to get a specified um, performance from your, your machine learning algorithm. So what we've done to, to, to test that, so you, you can have various uh, uh, drifts of your data, which can arise either, say, if you've got some uh, 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 technical parameters, which are not under your control, or it could be, uh, it could be some situational parameters, for example, you may have fog in an image or something which which would reduce your the performance of your of your algorithm. Um, so what we what we did is we we wanted to start off with some very high quality image uh, where uh, here we're not defining exactly what we mean by quality, but which which we mean that where we know that the machine learning will work very well and see uh, at what what quality is needed in order to still keep the uh, appropriate performance on your machine learning task. So here we took some, um, some pictures with a uh, drone, so raw images again, and we, it was uh, fairly easy to train a, a machine learning network to identify cars. So this worked very well. And then we also emulated a, um, uh, we wrote an end-to-end -end physical emulation of how those same images would have looked taken from a satellite with different properties. So we emulated the optics, we emulated the dynamics because the satellite does move very fast and that can lead to motion blur and other uh, sorts of effects. Um, we emulated how the light is uh, captured, we emulated the sensor geometry and the readout of the sensor and so you see that from the top left very clear car that you see with the drone you get the bottom left blob from the satellite and now the question is how bad can that blob be to maintain the performance of your machine learning and also if you look at the the, 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 the right uh, uh, hand section of this slide uh, you see that the cars are clearly visible on the top picture but on the bottom picture which is a satellite emulated one they are very blurry uh, and by eye it's virtually impossible to see the car unless you already know that it is there. On the other hand, machine learning, because it has, especially if you give it raw data, it has access to some very fine statistics uh, which it can use in order to achieve some high performance even on a relatively uh, uh, bad image. So, what we did is uh, we emulated all of these uh, parameters and we, we varied all of these parameters across an entire range. Uh, here we, I selected only two uh, to illustrate. So we started off with the little black sample at the bottom right of the, of, of the graph, which had high illumination and which had a very sharp focus. So this is the drone image. And then what we did is we generated synthetic data through the physical model by artificially decreasing uh, the illumination, uh, as in you have uh, uh, your satellite captures less and less light. And we also increased the blur of the image uh, by defining that your, 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 your satellite has a smaller and smaller optics. And for each of these uh, data sets, we got a different performance in the uh, from the machine learning. So the red, like red, means uh, high performance, and, and white means lower performance. And we identified an area where everything works. So this is how you can then define your tolerances for the specific task at hand, which is identifying cars in this case. And actually, if your task were identifying buses 
it would turn out that the compromises and the choices of of, of these properties might actually differ. So um, I want to highlight that uh, quality depends on what you want to do with your image. Um, so once you identified the tolerances uh, according to the task performance that you obtain with those specific pa parameters, what you can do is typically you can bring your, your if, if the data is of a higher quality, like say it's sharper than you need, you can artificially bring it in within tolerance uh, uh, of, your, of your specified machine learning. So this is the same thing is if you've got a, a, a plug which gives you uh, 240 volts, maybe if you know that actually you need 220, maybe you can put a, a transformer uh, to give you the 220 volts and then you know that it's going to work with your device. Um, some samples you can also uh, detect if a, if a sample is out of spec. So if a sample is just not sharp enough, uh, if it's not bright enough, you can detect, well, that sample is out of tolerance, it's not going to give me a good result from my machine learning uh, application. So these are some plots, so again, modifying just two parameters, but in reality, you have a whole bunch of parameters. Uh, in the previous uh, example, we had uh, maybe 10 parameters. Uh, so on these two, which are engineering parameters, so mirror radius of the satellite and focal length of that mirror. And the, um, and the, the figure of merit here is intersection over union, which is how good uh, are your segmentation, how well do you, does your uh, inferred cars overlap with the labels that uh, you had. And so what we see is that actually uh, we, well, first of all, that changing your focus, which is very affordable, uh, is, is, is good. So you see that if you have a, a short focus F0.82 in this case, already with a fairly small radius of 0.3 meters, you already get some decent, decent uh, IOU performance for your machine learning task. So to summarize uh, this data engineering or, or machine learning uh, engineering method, you have two steps. The first is when you prepare your network, so and you do your data centric uh, analysis. So first you need to, in general, acquire higher quality data than you would uh, that, that that you think you need in the final task. Then you need to have a uh, model of how that data gets degraded according, uh, uh, according to different parameters and you can then generate synthetic uh, samples by and vary those parameters and establish what tolerances uh, you have uh, for each one of those parameters and what would give you the best results. And once you've got all of that, then you can run your task. You, this is your, your, your application uh, 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 going forwards and well, then your, your, your final system, which actually would be probably a much cheaper system than the one you used to, to uh, prepare your task. For example, you might have a university with a microscope that costs half a million, and then you want the final task to run in a doctor's office for 5,000. So your final, um, your final task will run on the cheaper uh, device, will acquire the sample, it will normalize the samples, bringing them into, conform into conformity uh, with, with the defined tolerances. It would validate that the parameters are within those tolerances, and then you can run your task knowing that it will give you the specified uh, performance. So now uh, with all of this, we said, well, all of this works with raw images. It works with raw images, because you need the traceability, you need to propagate uncertainties, you need physical models, and uh, most of the maths and physics doesn't work unless you have a measurement. So unless you can put a unit to your pixel value, uh, uh, unless you can, it doesn't work unless your samples are independent and unbiased and so forth. So on the other hand, usually raw images, uh, why is it not used uh, very much in practice with uh, uh, AI application, it's because they're often too big. So the first step uh, that we did was to make an image compressor uh, that would 
compress raw images, keeping the metrological accuracy, but by a large amount, so that they're smaller than a typical uh, JPEG. So, um, well, how do we how do we do that? We need to make sure that uh, that the requirements uh, are valid, that we can get full images out by the definitions that uh, uh, most people accept, uh, and that we get the high accuracy data. Um, this is a bit of a difference with respect to other compression, compression technologies. So the way it works is we take a calibration file from, uh, from a, a camera, so this gives the physical properties of how the camera works. We take the raw image, and then we have a preparation step which uses that calibration. Well, well, first of all, it embeds the calibration data and it uses that calibration rate data to output a calibrated image which is also uh, very well compressible. So this is not exactly a lossless process because we do manipulate the pixel values. On the other hand, the output image is still a proper measurement and it guarantees that it is a proper measurement and that it has a data sheet of exactly uh, how that measurement was taken and all the tolerances of that. And then that image is losslessly uh, compressible uh, by a factor of typically between four and eight to one. Um, so this of course had to be, uh, this concept had to be extensively uh, tested. So this is what uh, uh, our academic colleagues uh, have done and they have shown that this is actually possible uh, to within uh, many different properties that are used in machine learning but the concept is uh, from the engineering of the algorithm is generic so this works with any property that you would throw at it. Um, so finally um, what we could achieve was a, an algorithm that complies with the free, uh, that is very good in the free uh, benchmarks for compression, which is uh, uh, image quality, uh, speed, and compression ratio. Uh, it does take this to have this traceability of taking really uh, the image, not just as a picture, but as a proper measurement. That's a downside. Um, on the other hand, uh, in our opinion, this is worth the effort because you can do a lot more if you have those traceable images. So to uh, summarize this, what you get is to get, you can have very small images which are very high quality and also which have the embedded metrological data that you can reuse in order to do proper engineering in machine learning applications to make it very robust. So, as a summary, um, raw images mean to us a well-defined physical measurement. Um, unless you have that, some artifacts of processing may uh, impact the accuracy, uh, even if they are invisible to the eye. Um, the different application, um, the different applications need different image quality, even within the same, as Ariane mentioned, if you want to do, if you want to develop your image for humans to label, or if you want to do segmentation or classification, the optimal processing for each of those uh, um, uh, steps is, is different. Uh, if you have images as measurements, you can generate from them synthetic data in a very accurate way for following uh, physical models, and this can be used for engineering of neural networks. and um, if you have uh, the, the the size of the image is not the problem anymore because there are now compressors which which would allow you to to keep the quality and have small images. Um, all of this is based on the traceability from the origin of the image or through its steps. You need to propagate your errors. You need to propagate your your, your physical models uh, through your pipeline, and this is why there are. Uh, Standardization processes, which um, yep, sorry, which uh, which uh, we we are starting to get involved in, but in for which we found a, a very strong affinity with Gerhardt from PCO, and 
uh, I'm, and he has a lot of experience to establish that very long traceability from physical device all the way to machine learning algorithm. And I, uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you more about it. Uh, thank you, Bruno, for, for this nice uh, transmission of responsibility within the webinar. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, welcome to this webinar as well from my side. And thank you for the opportunity. And uh, um, let's say my presentation is more from the uh, camera hardware perspective because that's where I'm coming from and um, I would like to tell you something about uh, standardization or quality measurements which has already been mentioned by Ariane and Bruno and um, I would first start with uh, some explanations about image quality from the uh, image detection perspective which is manufacturer driven um, explain a bit about the European Machine Vision Association and its 1288 standard and uh, the G3 agreement. Show you some examples of uh, EMBA 1288 summary sheet. And just by you explaining the importance of one of the parameters that, uh, which is mentioned on the summary sheet, uh, what relevance this has for, for the application and the user. And maybe as well as already mentioned, the influence um, of the, for example, the dynamic range on the accuracy and uh, the influence on the uh, image processing as such. Then also I would like to explain a little bit the Quarab Limi um, initiative that has been started, I think more or less a year ago, which is more a user-driven initiative and finally, just tell you a bit how we met Dot Photon and uh, how we proceeded in our very welcome collaboration. Um, start with image quality from the image detection perspective, because nowadays, if we talk about images in general, you have kind of a digital image detection. Um, and there has been the European Machine Vision Association, which has been founded in 2003 in Barcelona as a association that uh, collects all the image sensor and camera manufacturers for networking and immediately within the first years, a few initiatives and standards were, let's say, forming and starting in 2004 with the MVA 1288 as a standard for characterization of image sensors and cameras. Um, we've been members from the very beginning because um, at this time and even before when customers wanted to buy or purchase or use a, a digital camera, uh, always the, the problem is which one is the best for, for my application. And then if usually the product sheets are placed side by side, um, very often it happens that for similar parameters like sensitivity, very different units are used because very different concepts of, of these parameters and ideas are presented, which makes it very difficult to compare and, and come to a decision. For that purpose, this initiative was started with the MVA 1288 standard. And within there, there is a concrete model of a camera and parameters that can be measured and a suggestion how to do that. And meanwhile, um, it has been extended from the um, linear camera model to a more general model. So you see here the images of the release from June 2021, which is 4.0. Uh, so it has grown, it's continuously improved and Everybody uh, who is interested in this work is welcome to join the working group. I also mentioned the G3 standards because there's not only the European Machine Vision Association, but also very similar imaging association or machine vision association in North America, A3 in Japan, the uh, JIIA, 
and they decided to enter into a global cooperation agreement on machine vision standards such that not each of these associations has to define their own quality standards but in turn they accept and promote the same standard that has been developed in one of them. Therefore, for example, the uh, JIIA takes care of a more or less standard for uh, objective and mechanical definitions and optical definitions for uh, objective connections to a camera. And uh, the A3, they host a variety of different standards as well. And uh, in 2014, the German VDMA, as well in 2015, the China Machine Vision Union uh, joined that agreement. Therefore, the EMVA 1288 standard is supported by all of these associations. This is just a selection of um, some pages of a full um, summary, EMVA summary sheet. Um, based on the requirements of the MVA 1288 standard. Uh, on the left, uh, you see the uh, at three different wavelengths, the, the quantum efficiency measurements. Then you see the basic summary sheet at the second from the left, giving you a collection of parameters like quantum efficiency, system gain, temporal dark noise, signal to noise ratio, sensitivity threshold, saturation capacity in various units, dynamic range, and the non-uniformities, the spatial ones and dark current and so on, and the uh, graphs that have been uh, suggested. Um, one of the major graphs is the photon transfer curve, giving the variance, the temporal variance, uh, along with the um, incoming light signal, the signal to noise ratio and linearity and all that. And these are complete summary sheets and uh, a couple of these values can be used for the jet row compression directly, if I'm not mistaken, Bruno. Um, if you look to this uh, second page of the summary sheet, um, I just wanted to show or explain why the dynamic range, for example, can have an impact on your application as well on the whole image processing. So in this camera, it was a, a ratio of 1 to 17,931 or 85.1 dB or 14.1 bit. As you know, 14 bit is more than any of the displays you're looking at can show to you. And then a valid question would be, why should I be interested in 14-bit if I only can look at 8? Well, uh, let me give you an example, and this is a scene out of uh, the window of my office, I can say, because if I'm looking out right now, I look to the same supermarket and it's already night here, so <laughs> very representative, but this has been taken in January, I guess it was with an SCMOS camera with this dynamic range. And I show you now a short movie sequence that has been recorded. And the first part of it is just fully scaled to 8 bits. So the maximum value of the 16-bit um, data is sent to the maximum value of the 8-bit screen. So you will see a, a car switching on the, the headlights and moving. You see the illumination from the supermarket, and that's a full scale representation. Then the movie will be replayed with a different scaling. So it's not a new recording, but the same data just now in a different way sent to the 8-bit screen that you're looking at. That's what we would call a mid-range scale and you could uh, enjoy some more structures in the shadows of these parking lots. And now a third time the same sequence is replayed. And again, more structures are popping up. You could identify more things. In total, it looks like a daylight event, but it's just still the same data with a different scaling to the 8-bit world. So the answer why should one be interested in using a high dynamic range is it delivers more information that can be useful for image processing. I don't say it has to be. It always depends, like Bruno said, on the application but it can be quite helpful. Let's come to the user-driven 
assessment of image quality. A year ago, um, a larger community of, I would say, very many facility managers of microscope facilities and scientists started with uh, initiative called quality assessment and reproducibility for instruments and images in light microscopy therefore i mean it's a light it's a microscopy driven initiative but nevertheless it very fast becomes a worldwide thing where people collaborate from all countries to define uh, the quality and the reproducibility of their daily image detection and processing um, from the very beginning, a couple of working groups have been formed um, just to, to read them down from illumination power to detection system performance, uniformity of field flatness, system chromatic operation and co-registration, lateral and axial resolution and so on, and even at working group 10 image quality as a, as a topic by itself. And uh, Bruno is member of this image quality working group as well as myself. And I'm also a member of the detection system performance because um, our cameras belong to that um, well range. And also you're really very welcome to join these working groups and help defining a, a, a good quality standard for these different tasks and these different directions. I just wrote down he here the, the, let's say, the motivation and uh, work definition of the working group two and the working group 10. Uh, the detection system performance is a bit more hardware driven since uh, a lot of hardware is involved and you will have to define the lighting situation, the detection itself. You have, we have to take care of the different types of detectors that are present in microscope applications. While the image quality working group tries to create kind of a metric to decide um, how high the quality of an image is. But certainly as, as Bruno said, this is application dependent because um, the image quality definition is very much different if you, for example, want to count cells compared to if you want to uh, follow a trajectory of a certain cell that is moving due to some metabolic reaction. Finally, I want to mention how dot photon and PCO met. And I guess it was in 2019 that I heard from a colleague who joined a conference in Switzerland about a new startup company with some very interesting ideas um, for a very efficient image compression. And I was fascinated by the approach that they use uh, the, let's say, quality parameters of a camera for more efficient compression because that's something that I really appreciate and I was waiting for something like that. And therefore we got into contact, we discussed and exchanged. They compared their, um, let's say, test measurements of the cameras with the results of the EMV A1288 standard. And very fast we come to the conclusion that the EMV A1288 values could be used as well. Um, in during the Photonics West conference in uh, 2020, we had the first common flyer at the PCO booth and presented it together with a colleague from Dot Photon with uh, Michael Desert. And in 2021, we included the Jet Raw compression into our recorder software, uh, which is a part of our software development kit. Uh, the next step will be that we are storing extra the uh, relevant. Um, EMV A1288 values in the camera such that they can be read out by uh, by the SDK and the jet can be used for the jet raw compression. Um, in our case, many of our customers from the scientific community at the very beginning can benefit from this very efficient compression um, because there are very many modern microscopy methods for the observation of living cells or organisms which create well, really large amounts of image data. If we have a look to light sheet fluorescence microscopy, for example, 
easily within half a day they are creating more than one terabyte image data and since these image data have to be processed and they have to be preserved if they are used for publications um, it's a huge amount of data that are stored or have to be stored uh, just to show you where this comes or where this is interesting i just want to mention what light sheet fluorescence microscopy is it's also called um, selective plane illumination microscopy and uh, with this um, the for the fluorescence measurement a light sheet is created which is a very thin line of light where perpendicular uh, the observer looks to that sheet so only in, within that sheet the fluorescence is generated and this is very gentle for the organisms because if for a standard microscopy uh, measurement uh, usually the whole light passes through the whole cell and therefore for all the the images that are taken always the whole volume is illuminated and this causes a lot of stress therefore it's not so optimum suited for living cells on the right photo you see a uh, photograph of this arrangement uh, which was taken from the uh, flamingo website and this is one of the first examples this is a non-profit um, approach where Professor Hüsken and his team has created small light sheet microscopes that can be sent to the scientist who wants to do the application. And we were fascinated by this idea and supported it from the very beginning with uh, some of our cameras. And here you can see two images on the left. It's kind of an observation of uh, embryogenesis, I think of a zebrafish, I'm not sure. So you could follow and observe over days how the embryo uh, is developed and you could follow the uh, differentiation of the different cells. Um, it's a fascinating method as well. There are lots of commercial realization of these type of light sheet microscopes like here for example the uh, Zeiss Light Sheet 7 which is the, the most recent one which you can observe here in application in a lab during a workshop in the Czech Republic. And you see for recording of all the data, even two cameras are simultaneously used. And as said, during half of a day, more than a terabyte image data were generated and they could benefit a lot from this comp compression. As well, other methods like suggested by uh, Andrew York and Alfred Millisking, a one site light sheet microscope. Uh, there are plenty of different approaches for this, and all of them um, inherently record lots of data because you want to watch these organisms develop over time and over the volume. So that's what I wanted to talk about from my side about uh, this fascinating compression. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, everybody. Yes, we do have time to share a few questions before we close. If you have not already, please go ahead and type your questions and comments into the webinar chat. All right, so it looks like the first question I have is, on your website, you mentioned metrology, correct? Could you expand on what is meant by this? It looks Hi. like you guys are so, okay. perfect. So um, actually, I uh, come from a, a background of metrology, which is the, the, the science of, of measurements. And what you mean is that you um, you want to establish exactly how a, a measurement uh, is taken, and usually that means with all the uncertainties. Um, so it can be something as simple as um, when you go to the shop, you buy a kilo of potatoes. How do you define that that's really a kilo of potatoes? Uh, and what uh, tolerances does the shopkeeper, what is he allowed to give you as tolerances uh, uh, within that measurement? Um, and so this is a very well-established uh, science. Uh, on the other hand, um, strangely for images, um, there's nothing really well-established yet. So images, they are for now just a picture because it's actually fairly recently that digital images came out. Uh, and the, the whole acquisition and analysis technology was for many, many years based on uh, taking a, 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 a photograph on film and looking at it by eye or directly looking at something in your you know, microscope. Um, 
And so, so it's only in the last maybe 10, 15 years, or, or since uh, uh, Gerhard mentioned the, the MBA was formed and so on, that more established methods uh, have been uh, created to or are being created right now to to um, to use those measurements and uncertainties. Um, this is with respect to say 200 years or more for other types of measurements. Perfect, thank you. All right, this next question asks, would raw compression be more effective in camera than software or is there, or would there, would there not be a difference? Sorry. I would let, uh, I would let that to Gerhard. <laughs> well, in, in general, um, I think this, for some applications, this would be the best possible solution to do the compression already within the camera um because it uh, you would benefit in twofold first of all you could directly store a smaller amount of data and second if possible you could uh, live with a, a lower bandwidth for the data transmission because most recent image sensors tend to have more resolution more pixels and more speed as well as uh, the applications tend to require more speed therefore yes this would be a benefit all right, thank you. All right, this next one is, it's asking me a specific slide, but I can, I'll just ask the question. It says, um, why does the ML network performance appear to decrease for the largest illumination and smallest PSF? It said it was on slide 24. Right, right. So, so um, when you're, so, it depends on how you train your network. So if uh, if your network has a limited number of parameters, then it expects data which is um, which which has a specific uh, PSF and uh, a specific illumination. So one option is to train it with data with more illuminations and more point spread functions. The network will learn it has if it has enough capacity it will learn to deal with those higher quality uh images um but it's not a given so actually my uh our uh, uh, uh collaborator from from uh, uh, the academic side he pr he proved that uh if you want to train your machine learning network uh with data which is more generic that comes at the cost of using up parameters for that and it comes at a cost of performance uh, with respect to having more normalized data. So um, yes, so, so, so to answer that is it's not a necessity, but if you want to optimize performance, it's actually better to normalize your data to a specific parameter uh, and yeah, you can hope to get better performance. Thank you. All right, this next question asks, does varying the focal length in this pres presentation involve hardware such as pre-designed lenses? Uh, yes, it does. So in that, uh, so, so this actually uh, we we asked um, a satellite manufacturer. We 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 saw how they designed the hardware and makes the hardware, and we also established what tolerances they have in in making that. So. It was a fairly uh, lengthy process. On the other hand, there are some other parameters um, like exposure time, which can be selected at front time. So what we saw is that if uh, uh, you wanted to detect buses, you would need a longer exposure time or you would get higher performance with a longer exposure time than the one that you would select for cars. So it depends on the specific parameter. All right, thank you. I think that's all the time we have for questions for right now, but everyone, if you have not gotten to your question, please look out for a reply from us later. If you do think of another question, you can let us know by emailing webinar at photonics.com. That's W-E-B-I-N-A-R at photonics.com. And just one final note, this whole session was recorded. It will be available on the Photonics Media website shortly, and you will receive that link in your email. So I'd like to thank our presenters one last time and thank all of you for participating today. This webinar was presented by Dot Photon and hosted by Photonics Media. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.